next topic is body systems. First body system that you should be aware of is the nervous system. The diagram to the right does a good job of explaining what's happening inside of the nervous system. Cell A and cell B are supposed to represent nerve cells, which are commonly referred to as neurons. Then you have a chemical that is entering a space in between. If you don't remember what that chemical is called, I'm going to remind you. It's called a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter is a chemical that is released by a neuron. The reason for that is because as the message travels throughout the neuron, it's actually going to be an electrical message. Eventually, it releases chemicals into the space. The space is referred to as a synapse. Those chemicals are important because they allow the message to move on to the next cell. On top of the next cell, you'll notice these black dots, also referred to as structure X. Structure X is going to be an example of a receptor. Note that the receptor has a specific shape, and that specific shape allows the neurotransmitter to match up with it perfectly. So, what do neurotransmitters do? Well, neurotransmitters allow for cell-to-cell -cell communication. That means that the cells are actually talking to one another. Each receptor has a specific shape that allows it to only match up with one specific chemical. This entire process allows for your body to maintain homeostasis. Our next body system is the endocrine system. The endocrine system is responsible for maintaining homeostasis. The diagram below that shows the change in blood level, blood glucose level, is a good indication of your body trying to maintain homeostasis. The reason we say this is because if you look at the overall average, it shows that your blood sugar level ne never goes too high or too low. If, for example, your blood sugar level was to go too high, you most likely have a disease known as diabetes, which means that your body cannot properly regulate your blood sugar level. If we look at the diagram above the graph, it looks a little bit complicated, but if we go step by step through it, you'll see that it's not that bad. Looking in the middle, it says normal blood glucose level. Then it gives you an example of what could happen. Let's start off by following it to the right. So it says if. If blood glucose concentration decreases, that means that your blood sugar level gets too low. It says substance B is released into the blood. Now substance B if your blood sugar level is too low, you can release something called glucagon. That's just a hormone. It stimulates the release of stored glucose from your cells, and then your blood sugar level increases. Let's say, for example, though, we follow this over to the left. So blood sugar concentration increases. Why would that happen? It probably happened because you ate something. Substance A is released into the blood. What substance A? Well, it's that other hormone that's responsible for monitoring your blood sugar level. That's the one you're more likely to see. That's called insulin. Insulin is going to lower your blood sugar level. It stimulates the increased absorption of glucose by your cells, and then your blood concentration decreases. This entire cycle here is called a feedback mechanism. Yes, you need to know those terms. There's usually at least one question on feedback mechanism on this test. Feedback mechanism, the whole reason you're doing this really is just to maintain that homeostasis. What's homeostasis again? Homeostasis means balance inside of your body. You never want things to go too high or too low. You want them to be more or less consistent. Insulin is a protein hormone made by the pancreas. The pancreas is going to be an example of an organ. Now, insulin has a specific shape. The reason why it has a specific shape is because it's a protein, which is made up of amino acids. If that shape is to get messed up, then the protein, insulin, would no longer work properly. 
What insulin does is it regulates your blood sugar level. Let's be a little bit more specific, though. Instead of just regulating it, it actually lowers it. If your body's unable to regulate the amount of insulin that you have, you actually, no, sorry, if your body's unable to regulate the amount of glucose that you have, you wind up having a disease known as diabetes. Diabetes means you can't maintain homeostasis. Target cells have specifically fit shaped receptors. So if you were to look at a cell, just like we looked at the um, neurotransmitters and the neurons on the last slide, target cells would also have receptors on them. And those receptors can only match up with specifically shaped proteins. Your immune system fights off infection. On the right hand side, we have three different types of cells. Only one of those is part of the immune system. That's going to be the white blood cells. White blood cells have a variety of jobs. They can engulf bacteria, or they can also um, help with the tagging and recognition of different types of foreign pathogens. Red blood cells are actually involved in oxygen. Uh, moving oxygen around your body, and platelets are going to be involved in blood clotting. So white blood cells, antibodies. Antibodies are actually proteins that can be made by white blood cells. And they're produced by the body to fight off infection. They use lots of fancy terms for infection, though. Typically, they're going to call an infection a pathogen. Sometimes they may also call it a microbe. Well, you'll notice that it's very vocabulary rich, so you need to know a lot of terms for the same exact word. A pathogen disrupts your homeostasis, and then you can become sick, and if you don't get treatment and you don't get better, you potentially die. Antigens are located on pathogens and act as ID tags. So if we were to see a picture of this, what would actually happen is you would have a pathogen. We're going to say the blue is the pathogen. And on top of the pathogen, it has these proteins. And these proteins are actually going to be our antigen. Now, those antigens are ID tags. And what happens is that along come your white blood cells. Here's my white blood cell. And your white blood cell sees that antigen and goes, hey, you don't belong here. You don't have the right identification on you. Once it realizes that, it has two options. The first option is that it can go and it can produce these things called antibodies. And what the antibodies do is they go, and they match up with the antigen, and they more or less break apart the cell. The other thing that can happen is the white blood cells can say, hey, I'm just going to handle this myself. And when the white blood cell comes along, it goes and it engulfs it, kind of like Pac-Man. And it can engulf all of the foreign pathogens that have entered your cell. Next thing we have is something called a vaccine. Probably most people have been vaccinated. A vaccine has a dead or weakened pathogen inside of it. And once you get a vaccine, your body remembers the disease forever. So the first time you get exposed, this is number of antibodies. You have a little bit of antibodies. But then the next time that you get exposed, you can produce a lot of antibodies. Since you produce a lot of antibodies, since it remembers the pathogen, you don't get sick. We also have HIV and AIDS. You need to be familiar with those. That's really the only disease which you'll probably be tested on. It's the virus that weakens the immune system. Last thing we have are allergens or allergies. Allergies is when your body overreacts to a harmless substance. It's caused by proteins located on the cell membrane of allergens. Just like how pathogens have proteins which are antigens on top of them, if your body says, hey, you don't belong here, 
same thing happens when dust or pollen enter your body. For the most part, people who don't have allergies, their body does not recognize them as being foreign. But if you do have allergies, that's why you feel like you're sick, because your body starts to fight them off, just like it would fight off an infection. 